Jimmy Allen's Business Big Wigs. Today, with the help of the multi quixie filing photon accelerator communicator device, Jimmy speaks with Frederick Herzberg. Herzberg states that people have two sets of needs in the workplace, hygiene and motivators. Hygiene factors describe such things as the physical working conditions, while motivators produce sustained satisfaction and feelings of accomplishment. And now, here's Jimmy's interview. What do people need? All people have two sets of needs. They have a set of needs which is inborn in them out of their basic biological nature, and that is to avoid dissatisfying or dissatisfying situations in the environment. They also are human beings, and they have an equal need to express their capabilities. Now, to keep people from being unhappy, you make the environment clean. In the job situation, the environment consists of the company policies and its administration under which you do your job, the kind of supervision you receive while doing your job, the kind of working conditions and interpersonal relationships that surround your job, the amount of money, status, and fringe benefits and security you accrue for doing your job. These are the sources, the means of keeping people from being unhappy on their jobs. What makes people happy on their jobs is what they do. What motivates people? Now, what makes people job satisfied are factors on the job that relate to what they do. What makes people unhappy on the job, job dissatisfaction, relates not to what people do, but rather to the situation or the environment in which they do their jobs. Now, to be specific on the jobs, this translates down into these factors, which I call motivators in the motivation hygiene theory. People are happy on their job when they achieve something, when they receive recognition for this achievement, when they find the work itself interesting, when they have more responsibility for what they do, and when they get professional growth or advancement in their capabilities or in a higher level task. Achievement on a task, recognition for task achievement, interest in the task, responsibility for enlarged task, and professional growth and advancement to a higher level task. These are the factors that make people happy and motivated. What makes people unhappy in the job is, as I said, the situation and the environment in which they do it. It's the policies and administration of the company under which they do their jobs, their tasks the kind of supervision they receive in doing their task, mm -hmm. the kind of interpersonal or working conditions and interpersonal relationships that surround their task, the amount of money, status, and security they accrue or get for doing their task. Does money make people unhappy? If people feel that they're not being paid enough, they're unhappy. When they feel they're paid enough, they don't feel unhappy. They're not happy. Now, these job dissatisfiers are called hygiene factors, and this might explain it a bit. Hygiene because they are preventative and environmental, just as water purification and garbage disposal. These don't make people healthy. They keep them from being unhealthy and they're environmental. Now, you must understand something about the hygiene factors on the job. They're what I call replenishment needs. They go back to zero. If I'm hungry, I eat. I'm no longer hungry, but I get hungry again. And even though I had a marvelous meal last month in Atlanta, I'm as hungry now as I ever was before. When a person is unhappy with his salary, he is as unhappy as he ever was. I assure you that a colonel that is bucking for general feels as deprived in status as he did when he was a private bucking for corporal. They go back to zero. 
When he gets a salary increase, he's no longer unhappy, but I assure you he's going to get unhappy again. It doesn't last very long. I'm sorry, there is no food that will keep me from eating. I'm always going to be hungry. This has nothing to do with the motivators on the job. Does your theory apply to lower-level jobs? Happily, uh, I don't have to answer that question out of speculation or wishes. This has been investigated. Mm -hmm. In fact, the studies, the same studies, have been reproduced on the lowest-level workers of the job hierarchy, even uh, maids in a, in a Veterans Administration hospital, uh, assembly line workers in electronic mm -hmm. factories, uh, food handlers, uh, right up to top scientists, and the identical results come out each time. What makes these people happy on the job is the ability to do something that they consider to be meaningful to do. And what makes them unhappy, whether it is a, a top-level scientist or a, an assembly line worker, is the way he's treated on the job. All I'm suggesting is a positive meaning in life can only come in what you do in life. And what you do depends upon what you're given to do. How can more effective motivation be introduced into jobs? In my own present research, which is pretty much now around the areas of job enrichment, and see whether or not we can enrich the job to make it more meaningful, more rewarding, to the individual. In the process of doing this, I'm getting constantly surprised, even myself, in changing jobs and improving morale and performance and the economic payoff for the company, even jobs in which initially I was completely, my, uh, completely skeptical that anything could be done. So all I'm suggesting here, empirically, there seems to be much more room for maneuverability than our cultural noises about this problem since Charlie Chaplin's modern times uh, suggested. There's a, however, <clears throat> there are other possibilities here, too. There are some jobs that should be automated out. <clears throat> because you can't motivate them. You can't them. motivate them. If a, ma a machine should do a job that a human being shouldn't do. And don't forget, there is no job to, in existence that a machine will not catch up with. Man's talent doesn't lie in doing the job. Man's talent, once it's, once it's developed, man's talent it lies in developing new ideas and trying and doing the initial attempt at doing the job until the machine can catch up. That's man's genius. The other answer is, if we can't automate them out, then let us not compound the felony. Let us not say to a man with a torque wrench tightening a bolt 10,000 times a day, you're happy. That is kicking him and then saying, aren't you delighted with it? What about job rotation? Job rotation, I, mentioned, I use the word job enrichment because when I got into this job enrichment, I initially fell into the trap of what was, is generally called job enlargement. Mm -hmm. And that included such things as rotation, which meant doing a snippet of this and then rotating off to do a snippet of that. And it was, it was felt that if you did a number of routine jobs in sequence, none of the jobs would be routine. But I'm sorry, washing dishes today and washing silverware tomorrow isn't an enriching experience. So we had to relook at this problem of job enlargement and say, let us not make it bigger, let's make it richer. Actually, if you will look at the motivators, what we do is find out, will this man get a sense of achievement? Not the company get a sense of achievement. Will the man get a sense of achievement? Is there possibilities that he can find intrinsic interest in what he's doing? Can we enlarge the job in the sense that he is given more responsibility? Upgrading. Upgrade, it's always upgrading. What happens when you don't enrich a job? One corporation, they had a very serious morale problem with a particular job classification. Mm -hmm. um, company came to see me and said, expert in motivation, come down and plug in motivation to this group. Okay. I looked at that job and there were no motivators. I told the company that there's no possible way of motivating these people 
with what they're doing. I'd have to change the job. Mm -hmm. And he said, you can't change the job. So I said, well, you have three choices with a man. You have the choice of using him. Mm -hmm. If you can't use him, get rid of him. If you can't get rid of him, have a morale problem. And he said, well, I thought you were an expert on motivation. I said, you've got an expert's answer. Is obsolescence a problem? Uh, this obsolescence problem is very serious. Now, what we're trying to do is meet this problem by uh, retraining. Uh, and we have, this has become a big industry, uh, training management, management development program, sending people back to school. But unfortunately, as I look at the problem in its widest perspective, I can just say that resurrection is much harder than giving birth. And I don't think this retraining is going to work. The only way to deal with this problem of obsolescence is to prevent it. And the only way that I know of preventing obsolescence is making sure what people do constantly requires them to keep up to date. Is there a payoff in good human relations? I don't see how a man is going to find more satisfaction out of doing a job that he finds no meaning in if people treat him nicer when he's doing that job. The job isn't going to change. He'll probably feel less unhappy, less uncomfortable in his relationships. But that's not going to enrich the job. There's a marvelous payoff in good human relations. Because if you have bad human relations, people are going to be unhappy. They'll restrict production if you have bad human relations. They'll restrict production if you have bad salary. They'll restrict production if you have bad working conditions, the company policies and administrative practices. And for this reason, you should always pay attention to these hygiene factors. But when you do, the improvement in productivity you'll get is not an improvement in performance. It is the removal of the decrement in performance from what we call a fair day's work. Is money unimportant? Money is the most important hygiene factor. I'm not saying that money is not important. I guarantee if you don't pay people more money than you're paying them now, you're going to have so much dissatisfaction, you won't be able to operate. But I guarantee that if you pay them more money, you will not get motivation. And I guarantee, too, that if you do pay more money, they'll become dissatisfied later on again. Is there a payoff in motivation? Yes. The payoff in motivation is to get what everybody is crying for. And that is not a minimum job, but a good job. What we're getting is minimum performance. If we ever unleash just one-tenth of one percent of the talent in our companies that's lying dormant, being bought off, being amputated, we ever really utilize some of this talent, I assure you that the payoff would be tremendous, not only in terms of human happiness, which is my concern, but in terms of the economic payoff. We've utilized talent the same way the industrial engineers utilized physical performance. That is, reducing it down to the minimum talent a component of a man's repertory of behavior on the assembly line. Mm -hmm. Now, we seem to be doing this same thing at the higher levels of man's capabilities as well. And organizational theory, organizational structure, rules, regulations, job descriptions, the whole thing is geared to meet the success that, say, assembly line operation has done for the rank and file worker. Mm -hmm. And, of course, uh, we, at the lower levels, we amputate less because there was less there. <laughs> but today, you know, we're educating more and more to do less and less. And this is certainly not a prescription for a, a happy society, and certainly in the long run, not for a very creative company. Motivation is what they want to do, and the motivators, the nutrient for motivation, is the challenge, the meaning, the significance of the task.